to be seated. Fantastic. You know, I love um, I love Easter. Many of you guys do too. I love it because I see men and women dress up in these bright clothes. You know, just amazing, right? Kind of this spring freshness. And if you think about it, it really should bring new freshness in us, right? And to give us uh, hope, to give us encouragement as we push on through because of what Christ has done for us. So this is a pinnacle day for every believer in Christ Jesus. You see all this crazy stuff that's going on in our world, our country. We are confident that our Lord Jesus has conquered death. And he's coming as he has promised. See, Jesus has been betrayed. Let me just share with you. Jesus has been betrayed, beaten, tortured. He was crucified as a criminal. And three days later, as he promised, he resurrected. One of the things that we do, the Wynn household, as I share on Good Friday, is we have a we have the, the, the dinner, and uh, my my wife makes lamb, and uh, we watch the Passion of Christ. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, by a film by Mel Gibson. It is rated R, just FYI. So, but it's something we enjoy because we realize that. Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, he was innocent. He's, it, it is not in his nature to sin, and he was crucified for us. And uh, it was an unjust thing that happened, but it was just so that we can have life. So think about it, the implications of that. And now fast forward, we see in scripture what has happened the day after, days after his resurrection. I don't know if you guys know this, is that Jesus appears to, to, to a woman and this is disciples in the room, except for a gentleman by the name of Thomas. Scripture doesn't say where he was. We can only speculate, but when Jesus appears to the disciples, he shows them his hands and his side and the disciples rejoice as they saw the Lord. So as we think about that through, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice of the promise for all, right? Wouldn't you rejoice? I mean, Jesus made what, uh, uh, what was wrong into right. He came, he overcame death. Someone says there's only two things that happens for sure in life. Number one, you're paying for taxes, right? Amen? And then number two, you die. That's two guarantees, right? Jesus paid it all by giving his life as a sacrifice so that you and I can have life. See, there's someone within the disciples who doubted. It was the disciple Thomas, right? Wouldn't you like to have that name doubting thomas i mean think about it if you're in heaven when god calls you home and you're like you see meet all the disciples right and then you said where is doubting thomas i mean what would he say right imagine you're in heaven you you see that and he's gonna say no my name is not doubting thomas i doubted once and after that i believe right <laughs> you see thomas had an issue he was a reluctant believer Right? So my goal is, I believe that God has a special word for all of us today, and um, is to change and to challenge those reluctancy that we have, those doubts that we have, into believing. Right? So the title of the message today is, is Seeing Believing. Is Seeing Believing. So turn your Bibles to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 24. We're going to go ahead and stand up as we read the short passage here, right? Uh, verses are on the screen. It says here, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again uh, inside and Thomas was with them. 
And Jesus came, and the doors, having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger, and see my hands. And reach here your hand, and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see me, and yet believe. You may be seated. So let's just be real here. Everyone has doubt. Right? Everyone has had doubts. But doubt is actually a good thing. Because doubt forces us to ask those questions. It forces us to discover and unpack the evidence that is in front of us. And pushes us to make a decision. We all have to make a decision. Right? Thomas says to his disciples who witnessed Jesus in flesh, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. So in essence, Thomas was saying, give me evidence, because I'm, I'm doubting what you're saying. Show me the proof, right? Show me the papers, right? Kind of like that, right? He's saying, show me. If you don't show me, it's all hearsay. I will not believe. See, the problem is, is that people, it's this negative spirit of remaining in doubt just because they want to. Does that make sense, right? They get stagnant. They get stuck in the middle. And another is that they're afraid of the hard thing, that when you believe things in front of you, things have to change, right? Right? So my first point is, is that doubt encourages examination of Jesus Christ. Doubt encourages examination of Jesus Christ. I'm sure you've asked these questions before, right, as believers. These are just things that I'm thinking in my head. How can Jesus be the Son of God? How can he be the Messiah? I thought he's just some cool dude, right, with a surfer haircut, right? You know, I mean, seriously. Was Jesus just a man or was he more than just a man, right? How can Jesus die for me? I mean, like, I know it happened 2,000 years ago he died, but what does that to do with me? Was, what was significant of his death? These are good questions. I mean, I have many more questions you have. But let me just share with you a man made by the name of Lee Strobel. He was that exact man. He was an atheist, and he worked under as a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. Many of you guys probably heard of Chicago, Chi Town, you know, you know, right? right? <laughs> he was a journalist, but he was also a lawyer, right? He was a lawyer. He attended Yale Law School, and his close analysis he examines the evidence. His motive was to disprove God. But lo and behold, after looking into the evidence, he gets saved. Amazing. And you know, this is not just like folklore of somebody that just did something. He actually is a professor today at Houston Baptist University down in downtown, right? Well, actually, it's not Houston Baptist. It's like some Houston Christian, I don't know, something like that. Anyways, you're a grad, you graduate of that school, right? He teaches apologetics. You know, apologetics is not to apologize. It's to defend God's word after close examination. See, the evidence is looking at where Jesus lays. This is called textual criticism, right? This is a very good thing. And it's obvious that you can't go to the scene 2,000 years ago, but you can still read the text, the evidence, right? That is enough. See, when you examine in the evidence, the text, God will reveal to you the truth. Jesus' death and resurrection is what matters most. This is why, this is like the Super Bowl of all Super Bowls, right? Is this day because of his sacrifice and that he overcame death and had risen. Let me tell you, that should give you hope. If you think about it as our, age, our body ages, right? What do they say? 
uh, that women actually will far exceed men, right? You know, as you guys know, we are, Joy and I, uh, you know, Joy lost her mom, etc. Um, so we're looking, having to re, re, rethink some things in life. And uh, I was uh, uh, personally, this is off script here, you know, we have a life insurance policy. You guys have that right through work, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't, you should have it, right? Just as an extra, uh, extra support for you and your family. And we were looking, I was reviewing it, and I'm thinking, you know what? The best thing that you could do, yeah, plan ahead, but the best thing you could do is to live your life for the Lord. Amen. That is the eternal guarantee because these eyes, these young eyes, are looking at you, not when everything is fine and dandy, but, but when there's pressure. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Gat is, means olive. Gethsemane means olive press. Jesus goes and he prays as he was pressed on what he's going to do is to save humanity. So yes, his death, his resurrection, man, it matters a lot. Let me just tell you, it matters a lot. It's not just this pink shirt that I'm wearing, right, and your blue shirt and you know, all that stuff. It's great. It's it's uh, springtime, right? But let me tell you, the spring, the greatness of what God has done is amazing. So let me share why. Jesus did rise from the dead. And in fact, uh, it is vital for the Christian faith. If we do not, if Christ had not risen... All of this is like meaningless. Think about it. We might as well play golf every day, right? Seriously, right? Nothing to those people that play golf, okay? Right? There's time for that. But think about it. Because of Christ and what he has done, do you know there are hospitals built today because of what Christ done? There are missionaries and mission boards that exist today because of what Christ done, right? There are Areas in other continents of the world because of Christ, what Christ has done. There's sacrifice because what Christ has done. There's adoption because of what Christ has done, right? There's prison ministry because of what Christ has done, etc., etc., and so much more because of what Christ has done. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says this, If Christ has not been raised, your preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Amen. So if Christ had not risen, I'm just like a noisy gong here. That you're here, you're waiting here like a motivational speech. It's not about a motivational speech. It's about Christ. So here are the evidence. Number one, if just as a as just a just a review, Jesus fulfills the many Old Testament prophecies. All right. So all these 66 books make up one big story, and it's God's love for humanity because they could not save themselves, right? You cannot separate the Old Testament from the New. Throughout the Old Testament, God promises people that a Messiah, a Savior, perfect, 100% man, 100% right God, was going to change life. God tells the Israelites that a specific sign, specific signs and attributes would be characterized by the one who he would send. Jesus was going to be born and he was going to die. Right? Number two, Jesus confirms his words and his works. It wasn't all about over-promising. He actually delivered. He delivered ten times over. You see, the twelve disciples were eyewitnesses of this. That's what we have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These are the synoptic Gospels. Synonym means the same, but different perspectives, right? Okay? So these four Gospels talks about his life, right? And what he has done. Number three, Jesus really died. It's an empty tomb. So if you look at the, if you just Google this, this, the picture of Golgotha in the garden tomb. You see all the tombs of God, small g, all the remains are still there. <laughs> we have a God that overcame death. That is significant. Amen. 
right? Let me just share with you, and I shared this with you before. You know, I, um, I shared it with the men actually this past Wednesday. We had a great Bible study. And um, I was sharing with them at a young age, I've seen in my single digits, right? I've seen horrendous act of evil at that young age that no boy should sin. Maybe you guys, you know, kind of had that experience too, but really simple things. But God had already planted in my heart early on when I was in a Buddhist temple saying with all these Buddhist gods that there should be only one God. At age four or five years old, I can remember. Okay? So don't be afraid. Always ask those questions. Be challenging of those questions because those questions demand for you to look at evidence, which is now our next step. Number two, doubt encourages a decision. Doubt encourages a decision. Verse 26 of our text. After eight days, okay, so day one, that's when the disciples will tell them, Thomas, hey, we've seen him. We put our hands inside, etc. It's like, I won't believe you until I see it myself. So eight days later, his disciples were again inside this room, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, and the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, I mean, he, he like laser point to Thomas, reach here with your fingers and see my hands. And reach here with your hands and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. See, Thomas had to make a decision. He was told by the twelve, by the disciples, eight days later, right? He would have to examine the evidence himself. You're probably saying, well, pastor, if I was there, I would believe as well. But the problem is I wasn't. Understand, right? This is obvious. Yeah, that, that was like 20, uh, 2,000 years ago. But we have the evidence in front of us. It's in front of us. Yet you still don't believe, right? That's the question that we have. So let me just encourage, don't be afraid to make that decision. Don't be afraid to make that decision. Fear is an evil spirit that keeps you stuck. That keeps us stuck. It keeps us stagnant. Left with more questions than answered. Sometimes the answer is right in front of you. It's God's word. Right? And it withstands time, culture, whoever is the present. It doesn't matter. God's word stands in its time. You know what's sad today? I was reading and reviewing my notes this morning. And I looked in my news feed. In, in Africa, there were 45 parishioners in Africa, I don't know where in Africa, they got this, they got into like an old 1960s school bus, okay? They ain't running very well, okay? And uh, they, they were in the mountains because it's Easter Sunday. They desire to go and celebrate Easter Sunday and the, 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 the bus fell off the cliff and all 45 of them perished. But let me tell you, what great reward for these 45 parishioners because they're in the presence of the Lord today. Right? They desire that. You know, for us here, you know, we get on 1488 or 362, whatever, 290. And it's like, hey, it's like, these people from many countries, they sacrifice. No AC, bumpy road. They don't have these air suspension and all these different things, right? Air conditioning. They go there because it matters to them. It matters to them of what Jesus has done. So let's, let me just... Uh, just share this here with you. The issue that we have. What if I choose to believe? Will things have to change in my life? Because I think that's what the conundrum is. We have the evidence. But sometimes for some people, they're like, you know what? I know it's there. I believe. But I just don't want to let go of these things. I'm having too much fun. Yes. Absolutely. God is patient. God is kind. God is good. Let us walk you through your walk in the Lord. See, Christianity is not a religion, but it's a lifestyle. It's not a one call, hey, I, Lord, Lord Jesus is my, my Savior in summer camp, and that's it. You've got to work out your salvation, right? 
Don't think 10 steps ahead. Think one step at a time. Maybe the call is for you is to just to know the Lord. And maybe you guys know uh, the Lord Jesus, but have not walked faithfully. Hey, it takes one step back to love him and, and, and see the goodness that he has. Let me share with you a story in John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus. He's a man of questions and speculation. So he approaches Jesus at night. It says here, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisee, a smart scholar, religious man named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You got that right. And Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot have the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's room and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that which is born of the flesh is the flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said this to you. You must be born again. In other parts of the world, as Christians, we're called born again Christians. Because truly, we are born again. A decision that you and I have made, right? We are to be born again. But what I'm talking about is that people that are still on the edge, they, they believe, they see the evidence, but they're like, man, I don't want to change my life. I'm having too much fun. I'm partying. No, I'm just kidding. You guys don't party. You guys look at like 8 o'clock, right? Anyways, right? You party at lunch is what it is. You just party early. <laughs> but, you know, for his given you know, pork bud and all those things that you guys were talking about. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So you see, after the death of Jesus, this same Nicodemus came at the cross. And he came by night, but he also brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds of weight. He went overboard. You know why? Because he knew that this is not just man that died. He knew that this was the Savior of all. He went over. This is this hundred pound weight of myrrh and aloes. This was like for someone that is high in the, in the scale. He goes. He makes his decision. The question is, what is your decision? You see, not making a decision is making a decision. Right? <laughs> There is no neutrality. You're either for him or against him. You can't outsmart him and be on the fence and say, hey, you know what? I'm only this way on Sundays, but six, to day, six days out of the week, I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. No, you got it all wrong, right? So let me tell you, it is worth it. You battle through and wrestle. You ask the questions because the questions, you have to make a decision. And decision of faith, which leads to point number three. We need to live by faith. We need to live by faith. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Question mark. Blessed are they who do not see me, yet believe. This is what faith is. You will not understand everything. I don't understand everything. The brother said, Hey, Pastor Shirley, you know everything. I'm just Fact check, I don't. Okay, spoiler alert, I don't. Okay, all right? If I have a question, ask my wife. That's okay. <laughs> see, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> right? See, I have the resources to deepen my walk. And yes, my questions, I have questions, but my decision is always grounded in faith. The Bible says, you know, when Jesus was speaking, he said, I'll tell you, how can you understand earthly things that I'm telling you? I can't even speak about heavenly things. You're barely grasping the earthly things I'm sharing with you. So we know that God, 
He says he loves you. He loves me. He died for you and me. But he gives us one uh, small step ahead. And that's the answer of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says this. For we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews eleven six, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Think about it. Faith is the undercurrent of life, our lifestyle and our desire to live for the Lord. Yes, you will not have know every single answer. Proverbs chapter 3 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Let me share with you this illustration. This is the closing, y'all. We're ending pretty fast here. So this is um, this is my my mother-in-law's glasses, Becky Smith. As a matter of fact, when I was going to go home to see her for the last time, I had forgotten this. She left it in our house, and uh, on our way here, I was like, "Man, I forgot my I, I forgot." Graham's is glasses, but my wife brought it. You know, she's my, she always helps me out. And she, I was like, going to wear it. And she wore it. She's like, man, I cannot see. I was like, how is she driving? <laughs> anyway, she's not in a different state. Anyways, you think about these, mag, like, magnifying glasses almost, right? Her vision is totally different. You know why? She's in the presence of the Lord. Amen. So all your body aches and all these different things, arthritis, sore knees, sore sh shoulders, whatever else it is, this one. You have a new body. And more importantly, you are with the Lord. Praise God. Forever. Amen. Can you imagine that? And many of you guys, this past few years have been really hard. Some of you guys have lost somebody. Somebody you love. As Christians, we know we will see them again. For those that follow after their heart, even a young age, you know, I work in a hospital. You guys you see the horrible deaths of happening to these little children. What men can do in the lives of these children. Whether it's an accident or whatever. They are in the presence of the Lord. People that profess Christ as their Savior, they are in the presence of the Lord. So what does that do to you and me? It gives us hope. It gives us hope because the world is not getting better, y'all. I don't care who comes in November, who wins, I don't care. Christ is still our King. Amen. And remember that. Our hope is in Christ. Just now, do we have to do our civic duties and everything? Absolutely. You, do, you should do that as a Christian. But our eternal promise is in the Lord. So if you look at your glasses, and if you have glasses, go ahead and throw them out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that. I want you to take your medications and all see your doctors and all those different things. But imagine no more struggling, no more pain, no more anger. No more sadness. Nothing. All the holes in your heart will be filled because you are in the presence of the Lord. It's a win-win. You understand? It's a win-win. You as Christians, you don't really die. You live forever in the presence of the Lord. But for those who do not know Him that are indecisive in their decisions, well, you better put on your glasses. Because there's no hope. For Christians, there is hope. So if you've never made the profession of Jesus Christ as your Lord, it's in your heart. Not, I'm not talking about tradition. I'm not talking about summer camp or anything like that. Those could be real, but do you really ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Do not miss out. What great day of celebration brings you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Oh, what blessed hope that we have. 
Lord, it's been hard. It's been hard for many of us. And sometimes we just don't understand what is going on. But Lord, we know that you carry us through it as our Lord and Savior. And for those that made those decisions to follow you, Lord, what eternal blessing that is. Give us encouragement as we push through in life. Not that we have to try harder, but we have to be obedient and to keep up what we believe, what we believe. And Lord, for those that may not know, maybe people that we're praying about, children, grandchildren that do not know you, people that you place in our heart that do not know you, Lord, really, I pray, God, that you would answer, you would soften the hearts to know, God, that with you, there's no regret. Lord, thank you so much for this special day that we celebrate once a year. But Lord, let it not be just once a year. Help it, help us and remind us to recognize every day is a blessing. The blessed hope that we have. Father, we love you. Thank you so much.